Hi everyone, and welcome to Happy Not Satisfied. My name is Dan Morrison. I'm the founder of Happy Not Satisfied and the host of this brand new podcast. Um, very excited to kick this off with a super special first guest. Um, someone that is an Academy Award winning film, television, new media, Broadway producer. He was named one of Hollywood's new leaders by Variety. He is an amazing person, a close friend of Apartment 3C. Um, hello, Andrew Carlberg. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for agreeing to join me. Um, I can't wait yeah. to, to dig in and, and chat with you a little bit. How are, how are things going with you? Good. I'm excited and nervous to be your guinea pig for this. I, this is episode 001. I mean, this I is a big deal. <laughs> I assume the second one will be Oprah Winfrey, so I'm well, very, yes, very it's happy. Between, yeah, it's between <laughs> Oprah Winfrey and um, you know Michael Jordan, but we'll see who, <laughs> who comes in first. But uh, no, I, I'm really, really excited to have you here. And mm. as obviously someone that's super successful... Uh, in your industry, I know that you can speak a lot on th sort of the topic of this podcast, which mm -hmm. is dealing with, you know, we only see the tip of the iceberg from people and it's easy to think that person got lucky, that person just caught this lucky break, but really we have no idea what went into it, the crit, the tenacity, what the rest sure. of the iceberg looks like. So um, I would love to just kind of jump in and maybe hear a story or a time or, or a feeling that you had where this kind of happened to you maybe where it looked lucky to someone else but that's not at all the whole story sure well, i feel like maybe the the most obvious place to start is with the film skin because that is what i absolutely get asked about the most out of all of my work probably combined you know is people reference skin the most and i think people see that it won the oscar and thought that it was like that was its journey from the beginning and that's how it was envisioned and all this kind of stuff when in reality it didn't get into anywhere for a long time and it was an incredibly stressful hard project to make i got brought on a couple of months before we started shooting it um, by one of the fellow producers, Jamie Ray Newman. And Jamie had lost a, a producer at one point and she was just like, you know, we're looking for a producer for this. I saw her posting about it on Facebook. She had and I, she and I had known each other socially um, prior to that. And I kind of asked to, I asked to read the script and it was incredible. And so, but I also knew that it was going to be, one of the most challenging things I had done, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to do it, because I knew I was going to be flexing a ton of producer muscles, you know, dealing with with kids and animals and special effects and drones and hair and makeup that was uh, out of this, uh, the ordinary world of what you're dealing with. But that that's, again, like I said, what made it kind of an attractive feat. Um, we shot the film in four and a half days. It was squeezing rock from a stone budget wise but also just you know at for those that have seen it there was a bunch of locations to it it's not like we were just like kind of plot and base camp and then going off and doing our thing it's like we were moving all around los angeles like some of our locations were an hour away for it from where any one of us lived you know and um of course we had our own challenge just to shooting like we had the we the reason we shot four and a half days is be, instead of four days is because we had to replace an actor you know and all that kind of stuff and so and then we made it we knew that it was something that we were really proud of we were like this is much like the script this is unlike something anybody had seen before it felt like we were using every moment of screen time um to its utmost advantage you know and um and then it just it didn't get in anywhere it didn't get into any festivals even though um i know i was an alum of all the festivals we were we were submitting to but it didn't get into sundance it didn't get into south by it didn't get into tribeca it didn't get into palm springs and we were kind of like mm, maybe this doesn't have a life to it you know maybe we saw something that other people aren't seeing but then it got into holly shorts which is a festival that's been incredibly supportive and continues to be um to all of us over the years and um, it ended up winning Holly Shorts, which made it an Academy qualifying film. So it was then eligible for an Academy Award. So with with the Oscars and the short film categories, you have to qualify to be to be nominated. Basically, you know, it's not like they can just like they don't just cull through YouTube or something like that and like find their favorite. It's like you either have to win a qualifying festival or you have to have a theatrical exhibition. Um, 
And that's what allows something to qualify um, for the Oscar. So it qualified, and then the whole kind of trajectory of that short changed. You know, it started getting invited into other things, and then six months later, you know, it had it had won an Oscar, which is still crazy to think about. Like, I don't think any... I know none of us were expecting that, and it truly was, like I said, it happened so fast after the kind of course changed, and that whole process is just a whole surreal thing in itself. You know, the, the nomination campaigning, all that kind of stuff. Well, first of all, I can say it absolutely deserved it. I mean, that's, it's an incredible, incredible work of art, that film. And and congratulations. Um, I appreciate it. But I, I would imagine like, you know, when you win an Academy Award, you kind of garner some attention, right? When that happens. But I would also imagine that most people have no idea what happened before that like you guys kind of poured your heart and soul into something and Mm. felt like it was special and then sounds like you thought maybe this is just going to literally go nowhere and yeah i mean see this yeah i mean that's definitely what was thought and so um it was a and it's got it's played hundreds of festivals now and i mean it's definitely the most successful thing that we've all done at this point probably and so um you know it definitely uh it definitely was mind blowing, but then at the same time, it's interesting because you, you, yeah, you get you get your moment on that stage. But then, I for me, I still had to go next day to rehearsal for another project that was like, you know, and you're kind of like, it, it, the grind doesn't stop, you know. What yes. I mean? you have to continue on, and like, and you have, and that's a that's a moment in time, but it's what you do. You still have to do the hard work afterwards. Um, you still have to like cat capitalize on it's not the right word but you still have to you still have the actual work to do you know that doesn't change and like i think it may change it changes a little bit more for like actors you know than it does for for other people yes you can get in any door easier but it doesn't mean you don't have to do the work i mean even the actors still have to do the work but the actors have a, a much bigger boost probably to their uh to their uh, a little more visibility perce- yeah right? to the perception of it all yeah yeah you know i love that you said that that like the next day you're going to rehearsal because something i think about and talk about a lot is this idea of the, like there is no end right it's mm-hmm. not like oh i won an academy award so i've just like won the game of life and now we're done sure. and, like, i'm happy for the rest of my life because of it and like this whole happy not satisfied thing is is essentially mm-hmm. like finding joy in the continual process of growth and like like you said it was it was sort of a check mark along the way but it was an achievement that was kind of the byproduct of your process of just like sure and i had done a working. ton and i had done a ton of shorts before that you know so i had like it wasn't like i just did the first one out of the gate like i had been making them for so long and all different types and kind of like you know i would never have been able to do that a decade before you know i just didn't have the skill sets in my arsenal and there were like a handful of projects some of which were very much so unsuccessful but that maybe immunized me with like a certain skill or something that like allowed me to then do it when skin came along yeah and i mean again like i think it would be like this oh this guy won an oscar like his lucky break but you just said you had done all of these things and had fa- like i would totally. love to hear a little bit more about sort of your your trajectory to that point and what that looked like in the grind yeah. that went into that I mean, well, I mean, I started by working on a television program, an ABC crime show called Castle that I worked on for, I did 78 episodes of that. And that was like truly the best, the best learning ground you could have because like you're always in a different capacity of preparing a show, a show's being outlined, then written, and then prepped, and then shot, and then posted, and then released, and then marketed, and so it's like you're always, like, dealing with, like, a million different elements of one show, and you're producing 24 hours of television a year, you know, so, like, um, I worked for the executive producer of that show, and it was, like, the best way to, like, get a sense of how things work, but, like, you also got a real sense of the rules of the game, you know what I mean, what turnarounds look like, what safety on set look like, what professionalism looked like, you know, all that type of stuff is is something that kind of got ingrained into you. And yeah, it was on a bigger scale with a bigger budget, but still you had to learn the ins and outs of, of that type of stuff. And then I had done a bunch of other... So basically when I... When 
Castle entered its second season, um, my my boss at the time and I went under a different ABC development deal. And that's when I really started doing a lot more shorts and music videos and plays and just anything I could do on my off time. Like, there were times where I would shoot a short overnight. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I had work on Castle during the day and I shot a short overnight, you know, or something like that. Like, so... Um, I really like felt like I was doing two jobs, you know, I was producing my work and then I was assisting and producing that show. And so, um, but that, those are the ones that like all paved the way. And some of those had success and some of them didn't have success. But I always say that like, for the most part, I can look at any given project and know why I did it. And I think that that's ultimately why I have to, what I tell people is like, as long as you can look back and know why you did it, it doesn't have to be always the same reason. You know, it could be that you wanted to work with a specific person. It could be that it paid you incredibly well. It could be that you wanted to learn something that you hadn't learned before. But as long as you can, the minute you look at something and you have no idea why you actually did that project or it didn't deliver something to you personally, that's when you know you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, with Skin, you kind of talked about, obviously, at first, it was pretty scary, but then it ended up being an absolute success. Are there any times that come to mind where it started out like not going anywhere and it ended up not going anywhere and like kind of what you learned from that? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely projects that will never be seen. And that's to their benefit that they never get seen <laughs> because they are not good. Sure. And so, um, yeah, it happened. I mean, like where a manager will like say like, hey, will you come on board this client's project or something like that? And then and you're doing it because of the person asking you, not because you actually think the project is good or necessarily that you're inspired by something. And then like and then that project sure as shit doesn't go anywhere and doesn't turn out well. But like, again, though, you can point to the like, oh, I was doing this to like be in the good grace of a colleague or something like that and so um but but yeah it happens it absolutely happens and then you just move on i think that like for a producer specifically and i I think it's different with directors but like for a producer specifically you can't you can't be too precious with the amount with the work that you do it's you being prolific is how you learn and grow Mm. and the the ability to find diamonds in the rough is greatly amplified if you are doing five projects a year or six or seven projects a year than just one project a year that you're trying to make absolutely perfect you know i I love that Uh, being the idea of being prolific and and yeah it's it's a numbers game a little bit at a certain point right like yeah the likelihood of fine and and i was reading an interview recently matt damon interviewed ben affleck um, I think it was for Entertainment Weekly or something, which RIP to the magazine, but it was a great, a great publication. It was one of the last issues of it, but he was, but Ben obviously has had very high highs professionally and very low lows professionally. You know, he's obviously himself produced Oscar winning work, um, you know, and had Argo and Goodwill Hunting and all that. And then he's had movies that are, that people literally are like late night jokes, you know (laughs) what I mean? With Julie and stuff like that. But he was like, basically saying like, you can only hope at the end of the day that people judge you by the best work you do and not by the worst work you do. You know what I mean? And that you have to believe that at the end of the day, that the good work so overtakes any missteps you've had in your work that like, and that's why you have to keep going. And I think if you're so worried about only doing good work, you can paralyze yourself and end up kind of not sure. doing any real work. And absolutely, you have to. It's all about taking risk. Taking risks is there's always like jumping off that cliff with a filmmaker and knowing that like it's going to turn out how it's going to turn out at the end of the day, and I can only control it so much. But like, yeah, you have to say yes to a certain amount of stuff in order for the great stuff to to come through. And for people to know that you're approachable in, like, how many times, if he had passed on everything, always, then how, after a while, people would be like, yeah, let's not go to Ben. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's just going to say no. It's going to be a waste of our time. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, I mean, how do you kind of think about how you approach what you do? I mean, you are so prolific and you, you take on so many projects and it seems like more and more things are successful. Like, what... What's your mindset when it comes to taking things on and how you juggle all of those responsibilities? Well, I mean, I, and it's the, the reality is, is there's like projects that I'm the lead producer on and then there's projects that I may be an executive producer on or a different, have a different 
roll in. So, I mean, you can't, you can't lead produce 50,000 things a year. That's just not feasible. It's just like you you can't be in multiple places at one time. And, and I've made the mistake of trying to split myself in the thick of something between two projects that needed me and it did not turn out well. Um, I mean, both projects I was proud of, but like it, it, almost killed me in the process, mm. you know, and, it, and I was not happy. It was that and it's fun, interesting that you said, cause it was immediately preceding the, the run up for skin. And so I was like to have this juxtaposition of me at my lowest and then juxtaposed by me at my highest is, you know, um, was a very surreal kind of mindset to be around. Um, but in terms of like, I mean, it's, I'm a huge list maker. I have lists everywhere of everything of stuff to do stuff to watch stuff to read and so i'm always you know consulting these lists I'm, I'm, and i make a point to like to not waste time you know what i mean and like that doesn't mean that i don't like take breaks from stuff but when i'm actually working i don't waste time not working mm. yeah yeah interesting and a, a big takeaway for me i think just in talking to you is like you didn't just like hit the ground running out of college and uh, produce an Oscar winning thing. Like it, it took years of yeah. figuring it out and having failures and grinding and doing all those things. To and get there. Yeah. And working really, really hard. And I remember even when I got the job working for Lori Zacks, who turned out to be just a, a great phenomenal resource, you know, and she was the executive producer of Castle in my mind, even at that time, I was like, do I want to work in TV? And mm. my mom was like, don't be a moron. Like, you know what I mean? She was just like, take the job. Because like, in my mind, I was like, oh, I'm going to make movies and do all this. And it's, and it's like, and then that turned out to be the greatest thing I could possibly have done at that time. And I think that's great advice to anybody, but especially like young people, you know, it's easy to think, well, this isn't exactly what I want to do. So maybe I shouldn't even try. No, and it. I hear people all the time. that's like, oh, I don't know. It's like, I want to do this or I want to just jump to producing movies i was like yeah i was an assistant for years and on a very taxing tv show so it was like it didn't and i was doing the other small things that my cinema or people i'm always amazed at the people that don't want to do shorts mm. like that think they're better than doing a short film and i was like my some of my most successful work has been in the short form space and you're still making you still have the process of making a whole movie like no it's it, the the absurdity of it is like would you look at a 90 minute movie versus a three hour movie and think like, Oh, it's somehow less of an accomplishment. Oh, yeah, that's, you that's know what an I mean? Way of putting so it like, out. why would you look at a 20 minute movie to a 75 minute movie and think it's like anything you still had to like develop it, shoot it, make it a cohesive, coherent, full product that's then colored, sound corrected, scored. Like it still takes all the work of it. It's like at some point, yes, minutes is just a matter of like, extending but like a four day shoot versus a 16 day shoot doesn't really change your post process so like yeah you know it, a short is a is a huge endeavor and i mean and once they start to become and i really do believe it'll change and when they become more financially viable for like networks and stuff yeah. like that the thing that networks haven't like wrapped their mind around they'll spend like tons of money on like one thing and then when they could have spread it out over i mean but they do that with television too so um when they could have spread it out over over 20 things sure but they'll realize that that's a very lucrative thing and especially as like we continue watching things in more bite-sized chunks yeah 100 percent. i mean if i think of anything things are trending that direction in terms of just attention span if nothing else but mm -hmm. i feel like shorts uh some if it's a good short it's you know some of the most powerful storytelling i've ever experienced is is watching right. is watching a short so um i think that's incredible so what do you like mm -hmm. what's next for you are you just going to stay kind of on this path um do you have other ideas of where you want to go next i mean i want to grow a company which i know that you guys are in the in the process of doing too, but I feel like I've, I, I feel like that's the next step. And I think that's really something that the pandemic has, has illustrated to me is like, we saw how quickly just institutions kind of folded around us and that like people were so quickly let go from things. And I was like, Oh, if I could create a place that people were creatively happy that they knew that they had like a steady paycheck and health insurance and all that kind of stuff doing it just as much for them as for the work. Like I would like mm. to like start the process of growing a company. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And yeah, I, I completely, yeah. I completely relate. Um, and definitely had similar thoughts during COVID too. I mean, obviously there was a lot of, 
uh, horrible things that happened during that time. But it, it, for some of us, fortunately, it gave us some time to step back and think a little bit. Absolutely. I felt very fortunate during... I was shooting a movie when the pandemic started. We had to shut down. We had to go back like six months later. But while that was incredibly stressful, I still feel very, very blessed and lucky that that I was able to, to weather the storm without too much financial stress. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, what, so what's, what's, uh, going on right now? Like what, what's out there in the world right now that people can see? Yeah. Well, Unicorn Town, which is a feature documentary about a group of American football players in Germany, um, came out yesterday. So you can see that wherever you, wherever you go on demand for your movies. Um, I'm really proud of that documentary. I produced it alongside, uh, one of the Carolina Panthers and Christian McCaffrey, who mm -hmm. I'm from Charlotte originally. So it was nice to kind of like do something with a hometown, a hometown friend. And yeah. then, um, and I really like that movie because it's not, I'm not a huge sports person, but this is much more than a sports documentary. It's really like a, a kind of a, a cultural fish out of water piece. And so you're seeing how people acclimate to different worlds. Um, and then I have, Peace in the Valley, which is a feature film that premiered at this year's Tribeca Festival that is currently on the festival circuit. So it has a whole host of festivals lined up this fall. And then I have five shorts currently on the festival circuit. So they're all like, I have one called Elevate, one called North Star, the manager position, Lolito 10, and Sissy. Those are the names of the five of them. And they're all in different places. Um, they're all narratives with the exception of Lolito 10, which is a doc short, which I'm, um, I'm really proud and excited about all of them. That's amazing. I mean, yeah. talk about being prolific. I think that's yeah. super inspiring. So that's what's out. And then of course I'm packaging stuff and getting, I'm yeah. shooting a, shooting a short in Montana at the end of September that the state gave a grant to. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Which I'm excited. I'm, I'm making it with a documentarian who's making his narrative debut. Um, but he was nominated in the doc short category both years. I was at the Oscars and so we became colleagues and friends that way. And so I'm excited to do that with him. Very cool. And yeah. I mean, I think a huge takeaway just in this, this short conversation with you is just the idea of like, first of all, knowing that there's going to be ups, but then there's also going to be massive downs and you sure. have to find a way to learn from that. Um, and like, you know, saying, saying yes to things and, and finding your way and not waiting for the perfect moment, but just kind of going through and mm -hmm. figuring it out um and eventually something sticks right? and that doesn't and that doesn't mean not to say no i say no right. plenty oh, as oh, well sure. and i think that you the other thing you were asking like what's next is like i've been really like thinking like you got to work smarter not harder always yes. you know and so like there's certain things that like you shouldn't do you've you've grown out of that or whatever so but you don't at the same time you never know what's going to lead to some to something yeah exactly and i think i think what you said is is so true it's like you you can grow out of things but at the same time i think especially for people that are first starting out or, or maybe pivoting or doing something mm -hmm. new it's like you know just be willing to to try stuff and eventually you kind of earn the right to maybe say no or or pass on something but you've gotta you've gotta live through it first you can't sure. skip those steps before um getting to that path so right um i think that's sort of an interesting take but is there anywhere um that we can like find you like a website or social media or anything instagram like that? is instagram is perfect at andrew carlberg it's easy and i try to check messages as often as possible okay amazing well uh i mean i super appreciate you taking a minute out of your busy schedule with like your huge slate of films and everything no, that's going on course. to chat a little bit about this no, um, I appreciate you asking me. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, if anyone's interested in checking out Happy Not Satisfied further, follow us on Instagram. It's at happy not satisfied, and you can visit our website happynotsatisfied.com. And uh, yeah, this was episode one. Andrew, thank you so much. We're looking forward awesome. to the next one. Thank you.